So, uh, HIV, as most of you know, is uh, one of those immunological disease, diseases that uh, have popped up in the last 30, 35 years and uh, remains a challenge. Like diabetes mellitus, in medicine, if you know diabetes mellitus, you pretty much know half the medicine. So this is so, so important thing. So if you, if you know HIV, for example, you pretty much know half of immunology because HIV deals in a way that challenges your immune system. And uh, especially in modern immunology, you will see that happening. And again, there's a lot of media attention for, for right reasons. And uh, I'll begin with some of the immunological concepts that should be there for your basic uh, information. I just picked up uh, one of the slides from Time magazine. And there are quite a few other main, mainstream media this particular issue was published in 1993 and it was like a front cover it says cursed yet blessed i'm going to make you read what why do they say it's cursed and yet blessed <clears throat> Okay, now uh, some of the epidemiological things that you keep in mind is that uh, the highest incidence of HIV is in Africa sub-Sahara. So that's what the condition is. And for rightly reasons, in the same article, you're talking about one city, for example, in uh, Nairobi, and you can see what is happening and why do we say that HIV is an STI? And also that remains a public health challenge and it needs behavioral therapy. And uh, there's more to the treatment of HIV than to look at the social aspects for that. Now, the challenge that this particular person that I actually named, because it's very obvious, a concept and it's been, stu been studied for I would say seven plus six so about 13 years so they studied that population of these women and they wanted to find out that if they get such an exposure to HIV why they are resistant to HIV infection so that was a concept that they thought uh, that if they are in such a situation that they deal, they make it like their profession and they themselves are passing on this HIV virus to their clients, but they themselves remain resistant. So I'm gonna ask you this question. This is a question being asked by uh, immunologists for the last 13 years and have puzzled them. But based upon your information for uh, basis of immunology, why do you think what, what is happening? Because that's the basis of vaccine. They want to come up with a vaccine. Something that these women are producing, something in their immune response that helps them, that basically will make them resistant to HIV infections. So what do you think uh, could be the reasons? What could be the immunological reasons in this particular, or this set of particular, uh, I wouldn't say patients, but uh, people, people in the study group that were resistant to HIV for so many years. What do you think? Can somebody make a guess? Well, you do want to forget immunology because you're preparing bacteriology for tomorrow. So that's a good excuse. Okay, that's fine. Let me help you with that. Well, the, the thing you can think immediately, genetics. So probably something in the gene of this woman 
and that has been associated with certain HLA class 1 and class 2 alleles, this would say, because normally if you get infected with HIV, your cells have to present those broken up proteins to your T cells to get a response, correct? So there is maybe genetics for those women that uh, will make them protective and they don't get HIV. The other reason could be that they have CD8 responses, which are HIV-1 CTL epitopes. That could be another reason. The third reason could be that they may have specific TH1 type helper responses that are protective. And then they may have some specific IgA. Remember IgAs are those antibodies that are covering the lining for their genital epithelium so that doesn't get transferred. So you can see from here, uh, <clears throat> this is what immunologi immunologists were kind of thinking for so many years, so many years, and it became an enigma that even if you Google today immunology and Nairobi prostitutes, for example, so that's a concept there in vaccination formation that uh, they were struggling with. But then came the breaking news in uh, uh, 2001, you can see, because those people, especially for American Society for Clinical Investigation, they found out that eventually they were converted into seropositive. So they did get disease after so many, so many years. So they, we call it late seroconversion, especially you can see it is an article that was published. Okay, so the idea for this concept is that we are trying, still trying to come up with a vaccine. Right? It's not that we are encouraging people to be in that high risk behavior or don't change their behavioral patterns, but again, keep in mind that they are used as a study tool. So acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, that's what it is called, and uh, I'll try to I normally take two lectures on that, but we'll see if we can finish in time, otherwise we'll continue tomorrow. I will talk about the global impact and U.S. impact of AIDS. I will also talk about why is it that this STI. Uh, pathogenesis of human immunodeficiency virus is pretty much the same as you may have already picked up in terms of viral infections. I'll give you some clinical picture. we talk about treatment up, options available, and unanswered question. But the most important thing is that, uh, as I said, that it is an STI, a sexual transmissible disease, but what is the scenario in this kind of activity across the world? And the other challenge was, and uh, this came from the time, early 90s, 1981, when uh, first case of AIDS was found. And the, uh, the former Surgeon General, Dr. Koop had to say that. And that basically is an important concept that you have to have in your mind um, for any type of sexual transmissible diseases. And she was pretty much right. You have to look at like 10 years because 10 years may be the incubation time. Probably she wasn't an immunologist, so it could be more than 10 years. But the thing is, once you come in contact with something, it actually remains there. It's just like a memory cell. You take the photograph, it's just like a computer. You click, record it. That's what the immune system is. You put your immune system in a, in a, in a way that you show immune system a virus, a bacteria, a fungi, anything. And it makes memory T cells. It records in the system and it remains for good. You cannot delete it. I'll give an example for the computer hard disk that nothing can be deleted. Even if you put the delete button, still in forensic computer sciences, they can even pull out whatever was deleted ever. Okay? Now, uh, interestingly, 1981, so I'm going to give you a little bit of history so you keep an idea how they discovered these type of diseases, how it was discovered. So, is this a coincidence that a physician in San Francisco is seeing patients? It's like a routine work. And then he finds out there are like a couple of young white males. And they come and they 
have a very rare form of cancer. So that's, that's what he notices. A very rare form of cancer, which is called Kaposi's sarcoma. Right? And this basically used to occur in older people. So a cancer which should be there in older people, and this time 22 years of age, 25 years of age, these young white males get this cancer. So he treated it obviously, but he also recorded it, that what is it that needs to be done. And at the same time, especially for those of you who are not a scientist, we have uh, American Society for Microbiology meeting annually. We have American Association of Immunologists meeting annually. So all these physicians and scientists get together and they have a platform to discuss and have a dialogue. So then he notices that there is another person in New York and he says the same aggressive form of Kaposi sarcoma. But he notices something else as well. He notices that those young white males are gay. That's what he notices. And then he talks to the person who notices him in San Francisco, and then they take their history. They also were gay. So this is the concern that they have at that time, that something to do, but they cannot relate it. It could be coincidental. It could be coincidental. It could be just another finding. But it took a uh, lead from there. And interestingly, and there's another thing, maybe it can give you a role of pharmacist or maybe a drug technician, very wise. So that's why we, in research we say that um, you have to have more than uh, your ability to cram material or ability to retain material, reproduce material. You have to have critical thinking. You have to think. You have to ponder. You have, and again, some of the routine work. So this happens that there is a technician, CDC, Sandra Ford, that's what her name is, she suddenly noticed that there is a high number of requests for a drug, pentamidine. She notices that. It could be like computer, who cares? But she noticed that, it, and this is for a fungal condition. And interestingly, what he not, she notices, she notices that, uh, you know, the drug card or the detail of the patient, a doctor is treating a gay man in 20s and that gay young person has pneumonia. Remember I told you that young people should not have pneumonia. Some of the diseases are only for younger people and older people because of the problem with the immune system. As a young person, we assume your immunity should be good enough to fight everything. But if you get an extreme form of a disease like pneumonia, then there's a problem. The other thing she noticed was that nobody would ever ask for a refill for this drug because one dose of that drug was enough to treat pneumonia. Very interesting finding. And she also noticed that some of them either die or get treated. So she probably thought in her mind that there's something happening which is unusual. So that's the beginning of the scientific process of thought, that you want to put things together. And then the, the venue for these kind of activity is that when you go to these annual meetings, as I said, ASM and AAI, where all these people get together and they have an exchange of ideas and they sit and discuss. And this was taken very seriously, the observation of a drug technician that she noticed that's very unusual that they will ask for refill. So that's again something cooking, something happening, but nobody would know at that time that it's going to be HIV. And then again, it took a global impact, and there are scientists in France, probably uh, Europeans, were taking a lead on that. They were already working for that. They found out, but they were not able to link these two together. A cancer, a pneumonia, a fungal infection. Fungal infections, your immune system should deal with it without drugs. But if you need a drug, then this is, is serious. But if you need a refill, that's even more serious. Remember I said mycobacterium avium? So your immunity has to be a immunity of a bird, avium, if you are going to fight mycobacterium avium, because this is going to cause problem in birds. But in AIDS patient, your immune system becomes like the immune system of a bird. 
so small and so fragile that you get an infection that should not happen to you. A lot of this discussion historically, they wanted to trace HIV and then a lot of discussion, so and so forth. I'm not going to go in, in detail because it kind of shoots up a perfect storm all over the world. And then they found out that probably uh, it began in uh, Africa 1950s. So they came up with HIV-1 and HIV-2. And then again, I'm not going to go in details. Interesting, those of you uh, are into it, that they said that uh, in some of the African tribe consume monkey's meat and they kill monkeys. And then there was also the issue with Ebola viruses. And I don't know whether you, you can Google it. Then one of the CNN person, staff reporter, traveled to New York and he found out that it was, the monkey meat was even sold in market in New York. So there are many things happening here uh, about, sorry? New York. New York, New York, in US. So, so anyway, <laughs> the point is the world has shrunk. So anything happening, any part of the world can be easily brought over. It's just like computer world. So you can see that they talk about it. But the point is, I want to emphasize is that it was tough for them to look for, it took them like at least 10 years to figure it out. But now we talk of like high risk for getting AIDS. So who are the people who basically are at high risk at uh, AIDS? And I gave you a historical perspective, and this was true in early 80s, and it was considered, still considered, and a very high, uh, I would say, incidence in, uh, in uh, male homosexual population. But there are some alarming concerns that are happened for the last few years, and that has taken a big uh, toll on CDC and rest of the world, because the highest risk is, again, you can see women in heterosexual relationship. So that was even more than traditionally what we used to think, MSM, MSM men having sex with men, youth, sex workers, so on and so forth. And you can see that these people, because of their involvement in that kind of a behavior, would make them very susceptible in that kind of high risk, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, be, you know, activity. Now, the statistics I'm going to give you today, I just found out, I'm, I normally do that this morning, I uploaded the latest st statistics, but you can see that it remains as a very uh, important concern that women in so-called passive role in the heterosexual relationship, why should they get HIV? Uh, for U.S., again, uh, is a big concern for U.S. And as I said, I downloaded the data this morning. If you see even, it started with white male, young males. It still is a, still a high-risk population in this country. But for the last couple of years, the ethnicity of susceptibility has changed drastically. So we, can't, we kind of have like half of these patients, very high incidence, um, not only an incidence in terms of black population, but having a static high incidence with new cases diagnosed every year. So that's again something that CDC has to con uh, consider because there is no regression in that. There is no stop in that. So there is something happening in this set of population that they really have to be concerned about. Okay, now if you look at the transmission of this particular virus, and you can see from the major route of infection, interestingly, what they did was that they, they divided that into Western Hemisphere or so called uh, resource rich countries as compared to uh, resource poor countries, and you can see still. Uh, male homosexual and male homosexual and bisexuals remain one of the populations, especially in this part of the world. And then again, on collateral side, this is, when we say women, then again, we want to know what's happening to the children as well. So you can see from here, uh, 
most of the time, a female have an incidence because they have partners that may be bisexual or they may be homosexual that can bring in that HIV and pass it on to them without them knowing it because the incubation period is too long. Uh, secondly, we have the uh, drug users, intravenous drug users, that again remains a very high possibility. And then uh, recently we have also seen that uh, quite a few uh, incidences where HIV mothers will give birth to babies and they have uh, the disease per se. Uh, you can see that starting from 1981 all the way through, they have been so much work done, in, especially in research all over the world, in coming up with the drugs. We have drugs today. And we, but the problem that we have is that uh, as far as the social aspect of that is concerned, as far as a, a treatment for any STI, STI is concerned, the, the numbers have not really pulled up. They are rather de deteriorated. And I did post, those of you who are interested, uh, I, last year I discussed that. This year I took it out because they wanted to find out even a very high incidence in European countries last, latest, uh, lately, and uh, special, especially for the countries that used to be the old East uh, communist, communist bloc. And then again, uh, they also found out that inc incidence of prostitution and incidence of lower socioeconomic conditions were high that probably got uh, a raise in terms of people having HIV infections. And uh, <clears throat> WHO still, you can see, uh, talks about that. We need to get educated on ourselves as you, how is it transmitted, how do you treat. Well, I'll just give you, I remember, um, it was, I think I came to uh, New York in early 80s for some of my studies. And at that time, I noticed, especially in Brooklyn, the, the, there were no physicians there. So the, the, there were lack of physicians treating the patients, and the so-called residency positions were open. And then, then I found out because of uh, HIV scare, because nobody wanted to go and work as a resident in New York hospital, especially Brooklyn, because they didn't want to touch the HIV patient. Nurses didn't want to touch the HIV patient. So there was a lot of questions unanswered. So there was a big scare. So that kind of a scare, you can see over the timeline, needs proper research. It needs proper uh, information. It needs knowledge on both sides. Just like Ebola we had this year. But Ebola was not of that magnitude. But HIV was very severe. It was like a big, it's a bombshell. So that's what it happened. So you can see it impacted professions, OK? Now, uh, I may have some other time to give you a little bit of statistics, but I did notice, and uh, probably tomorrow I'll give you the CDC. Uh, but I've seen from 2006 till 2015, nine years, more or less, as I said, the ethnic population in terms of HIV infection, as reported by CDC, has not changed. You can see from here, uh, these are the cases per 100,000 population. So, so you still have enormously, enormously high percentages in terms of this ethnic background, in terms of uh, the new HIV infections. So this is to show you not the existing HIV infection, but the new HIV infection. Still, if you want to compare that across the gender, this was basically for ethnicity. If you look at the CDC statistics from 2010, you will see again, uh, both male and female, especially in black population, as compared to any other population, the only population that is very close to that is Hispanic population. So if you have like, um, it's like one in 10, one in 10. So if you have uh, 100 in, uh, you know, 100,000, right, especially for that particular area uh, is considered as a very, uh, very high, in, I'm sorry, 1 in 100, I said 1 in 10, I'm going to fail the stats, 1 in 100. So uh, the other important thing you can see from here, that proportional between female and, and, 
and male again is I would say one is to three but nevertheless the problem remains so the government is trying CDC to at, at, at least in this case it gives you the figure for female it doesn't give you the figure of the ages of those female but recently uh, I will just give you some of the uh, important graphics. Most of them are teenage girls. So we have a very high incidence of teenage black girls, 64% very high as compared to 18 and as compared to any other. So you will see these awareness, HIV awareness posted here and there. Uh, they are trying their best to get people know the facts and get tested. That was another challenge that many a times, if I tell you this, the number one transmission is heterosexual, so that will put everybody uh, in trouble. And then again, you can look at the CDC uh, information booklets, one in four. And then again, uh, people may have genetic or behavioral, I, I cannot really explain that, but this is out there. And many a time women get diagnosed because of the pregnancy. You want to make sure that doesn't affect the baby. So you can see from here, there are a lot of concerns as far as epidemiology is concerned. A lot of work has to go into that. Now, let me present you some of the clinical aspects before I go into the viral aspect. If you look at uh, HIV, for example, on the top, so you, once you get the HIV, then again, your immune cells will deal with it. And you may have a mild flu-like illness we call infection, like infectious mononucleosis kind of illness. And then you can also show some of the CNS symptoms like meningitis. There's an initial phases. And over month, either your system will control the virus, you can see from here, or you may have persistent lymph adenopathy. So this is also one of the causes of, for example, if you have a boil and they see that your lymph nodes are inflamed and enlarged because the antigen has been picked up by that area and transported to the lymph node and there were, there were T cell proliferation is taking place. That's why we have lymph adenopathy. In this case, it sounds like a systemic effect. So you will see not only that you have lymph adenopathy, but you have persistent, so it stays there. Like you have rubbery, painless uh, lymph adenopathy in, in some of the STI infections. Now over years, uh, you can see, as I said earlier, this, the virus stays in your system and you are passing it on to other people. And uh, sometime the presentation of an AID patient is because it's going to chew up your CD4 T cells. So if you lose your CD4 T cells, you are prone to opportunistic infections. So you can see there are some op opportunistic infection that you'll begin to show and it become noticeable. Or people will have some kind of a neuronal symptoms. One of the common symptoms that we notice is dementia. So they will lose their memory. And then again, they will also have opportunistic CNS infection. And then all those uh, viruses, fungi, protozoa, parasites, so on and so forth, will pop up because you don't have a good patent cell-mediated immunity. If you want to look at how a virus looks like, so you can see from here a small green structures. These are like circular retroviruses. And the largest structure over here is basically a, a immune cell. If you look at electron micrograph, you can see the virus budding from the cell. These are like small virus, like bubbles, burst out. So once it gets infected, and the, the electron micrograph over here, this can, you can see from here, this is cytoplasm, and this is a virus actually budding off from the uh, outer cell membrane. And when this kind of budding takes place, you can actually see under the microscope, and this is how it looks like. So see, tons of millions of viruses uh, are budding out of the cell. They are reproducing and multiplying. So when in AIDS virus, we talk of viral load, okay? Now let's talk about uh, because this is a virology lecture, so I'm going to spend more, much time on virology, not on the clinical aspect. So you can see uh, it's a typical HIV uh, structure, and then it has a RNA inside, 
And then the most important thing that we've been discussing is that some of the viruses will bring their own enzyme needed for replication. One of the most important enzyme they bring is reverse transcriptase. You can see RT, reverse transcriptase. And then they have some other enzyme which are called integrase and some other proteases. So it comes with those ases that are required. So the RNA is then enveloped in a capsid which is called P24. So this is where we're going to go in detail and uh, I would want you to remember each and everything on the slide. This is where, because we're going to talk about anti-HIV therapy. Right, so if you know this, you'll be able to appreciate how and where those drugs act. We haven't talked about that in any other viruses, so this is going to be the only virus where I would want you to go in detail and remember the words, like P24 nucleocapsids. You can see P24 over here. I don't know why. I think I don't. Let me check if I do. If it wasn't working, it is working. Okay. Then we have another a matrix over here, which is a second matrix over here. You can see from here. This one is P17. So P17. So it, it, it has many layers around it. It's like different codes. You know, it's like I, I usually uh, tell my students, it's like they feel that they are, they are cold. They want to put on as many clothing as possible. So why is it very protective? It's hidden deep. So you have P17 matrix. You can see from here. And then uh, P7 matrix is where the most important uh, structures are attached that will protrude out of cell membrane. So we have a bilipid cell membrane that you can see from here. So these structures, if you remember when we talked of uh, viruses, especially flu, I said H1N1, hemagglutinin, and neuroaminidase. In this way, we have two important structures and you can see from here, I believe it's on the extreme right hand side, if you pay attention to this over here. So we have that vertical, that, uh, kind of a, a rod shaped structure, which is a glycoprotein, we call it glycoprotein 41. And it has a globular protein attached to it, which is called globular protein 120. So remember that we will have drugs targeted again each and every glycoprotein that uh, is out there. Okay, so uh, I'll start from inside out. So we have the most inner P24, then we have P17, and then we uh, have the glycoproteins protruding out, and then we have an outer covering. So these glycoproteins which actually hang around the structure outside are the ones that will attach to receptors. So these are like for attachment. So HIV for some reason has a liking affinity for CD4 receptors. You can see over here the d for sign CD4 receptor. So um, the question for you, for those of you who did well in immunology, uh, what, are the, what are the cells that express CD4 receptors. Can you name some cells that express the CD4 receptors? Well, many a time I ask you the question, the answer is already there. <laughs> Rule number one, CD4 T cell. It is called CD4 T cell because it expresses CD4 receptor. As simple as that. And then some other cells of macrophage and monocytic lineage also have CD4 receptor. Now remember that it's just like HIV wants to go and attach in immunology. What happens is that you have one receptor talking to another receptor. So the cell feel is not, it's just like if you want to hang on to something with my one, with my one hand, right? And then hang on to something with my both hands. So obviously if I hang on with something, both, it's going to be more strong grip. So the T cells would not limit themselves to one CD4 receptor. They want to have another tight grip by having a chemokine receptor, chemokine receptor. And both of these are important for drug therapy because remember one of the first thing we need to do is to block that so that there's no attachment of HIV to a cell, correct? Either we block CD4 or we block chemokine or we block GP120 
or GP41 or do anything with all those glycoproteins. Does it make sense? So this is a very, very basic structure uh, from the HIV structure of the viruses. Now, the problem that we have is that, especially retroviruses, they have this RNA, and then remember that they come with, with some of the genes that are there that will help them to cause infection and help them to cause damage. So this is another slide I want you to remember. And again, uh, it's going to come from your anti-HIV therapy because if the incidence is such a high incidence, so you're going to see wherever you go HIV positive patients. So this is another one, which is basically a, the whole gene. We have a long terminal repeat. You can see LTR, long terminal repeat from, from left to right. And then these are expressions of those uh, codes, genetic codes for something that this virus carries on, which is like a, we call it like a HIV genome. So that's like a genome. And we have then sequences of these genomes. You can see some of them may be overlapping. So you see GAD overlaps with the part, part of whole. So we, if you look at genetics of that, you will see that some of them have a separate gene sequence and some of them are in overlapping block. But the, in transcription process, these are read separately. So they take like a sequence read separately, okay? And then many a time what happened is that they code. So they would code the sequence to be transferred to messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA is gonna be functional. Okay. Now having said that, let's go for each one of them and you will see why are we interested in that and what can we possibly do because uh, we want to come up with a therapy, we want to come up with some of the drugs that will each disable this virus or mute this virus for being so aggressive. So if you have, we already talked about the viral genome which is a transcript and uh, you get infected, so this whole transcript will be inserted into your cell. That's what's going to happen. And this is a long-term, long terminal repeat from one to another cell. Now, if you pay attention to the first one, which is called GAG. So this GAG is the one that is going to code, code for nucleocapsid code and matrix protein. You know, in the previous one, I told you the P24 and P17. So this, the code that will be translated to your cell to produce those protein is coming from that gene sequence. Then Paul, Paul is another important one because it carries the code for at least four important enzymes. And one of the most important enzymes is reverse transcriptase. We have protease, we have integrase, and we have ribonucleases. So you can see that one little sequence over there is going to go and code for four important enzymes that this virus carries. Then we have a viral code proteins, GP120 and GP41, that you saw were there protruding out, that just come like receptors. Then we have a VIF, which basically, uh, now what happens is that once this virus infects your cell, and your cell will resist, because your cell, cell wants to stop that replication. So, it's going to have an inhibitory effect on this virus. Now, this virus comes with a gene, a sequence over here, which is called a, a inhibitory sequence, which will overcome the inhibitory effect that it may have on that. And then it's going to help to promote viral replication. Then we have uh, other promoters, for example, increases viral replication, promotes HIV infection, required for elongation of viral transcripts, and so on and so forth. For example, one of these important is, it says, down-regulates whole cell CD4 ex expression. So this is another mechanism that, the idea is that these are some of the virulent factors, some of the factors that this gives this virus an edge on you. So you can, it's pretty smart that it basically would also down-regulate host cell CD4 and class 1 MSC representation. So imagine if it infects you, it has that machinery not to allow you to MSC class 1. So what will happen then? 
if this virus comes and goes into the cell, it down regulates your MSC class 1 expression. So what do you think will happen? There will not be any immune response because for viral infection, you have to have a small portion of a protein put on your MSC class 1 and present it to the other cell. So this virus comes with an ability to stop that happening. And why do we need to know that? Because we need to come up with something that's going to work as an antidote for that. Okay? So uh, summarize what I just said. That uh, is a HIV genome, and this is a linear genome, and then you saw in the different colors, some of the genes, as I said earlier, have the same sequence and other genes, they're overlapping blocks, and they basically are there that will require, for example, one of the things, it's just notice over here, that some of the genome will require RNS, RNA splicing. So they can kind of cut it up and paste it. So that is another thing that helps a virus to cause infection. So you can imagine so much uh, work has been done for HIV because of the incidence. Now, what happened in terms of pathogenesis? How would you get a virus causing problem in you? So just pay attention to the top. So we have a virus with GP120, that was the circular glycoprotein. And I told you that this virus has an attachment for the cells expressing uh, CD4 cells. So some of the antigen-presenting cells are there of the lineage of monocyte macrophages and some believe dendritic cell as well. But CD4 for sure, because it's called CD4. And this will kind of lock, lock into that. And then there are two different uh, outcomes for that. For example, if you have a good T cell response, if you do, so you can reduce viremia, and then you produce neutralizing antibodies and then uh, you can overcome, but many a time you do not because the virus is pretty much strong. So if you fail to eliminate virus, it's going to stay in your system. The other things that can, may happen is that there could be functional changes on the right hand side where uh, the virus creates a problem and you have a decreased immune response. And then again, regardless of whatever happens, you fail to eliminate the virus. So that's pretty much the case whether you have a good immune system or you do not have a good immune system. So you basically will have virus in your body forever. And then again, when the time comes, gradually over year, you will begin to pick up those opportunistic infection and then have a full-blown AIDS. Now, another important concept, again, as I said, that this will be a repeat slide for you for all viruses. Again, you see absorption attachment, and uh, then basically penetration and uptake into vacuole. You have a reverse transcriptase, who's going to open up the double-stranded DNA, and then all these transcription, translation will come, and then virus basically will replicate into, so this is a typical HIV replication cycle, and then you will have virus budding out of your cell, and then it releases out. So this actually is a typical from one to the last phase. Now, the first slide that I'm going to talk about the anti-HIV therapy is going to be based upon this information that you already know. It's pretty much the same scenario. So I'll use another picture to better display that. So you can see from here on the top, you have an HIV variant, and that's looking for over here two receptors. I told you there are two receptors. One is a chemokine receptor, the other is a CD4 receptor, and this will pull the virus into the cytoplasm, and then again, the reverse transcriptase will act in the mediate synthesis of proviral DNA. Proviral DNA will go into the nucleus, and the nucleus, all this transcription and translation will take place, and then again, the message will come from the nucleus that either to produce some particular cytokines or to produce a transcription HIV genome, and then synthesis of different parts of the virus. And then finally, you can see the expression of GP120 and GP140, a GP41 from the cell surface, and the cell will bud out. So this kind of an activity right from the beginning, attachment, absorption, penetration, uncoating, 
and macromolecular synthesis, assembly, budding out is a typical for all the things that we have today. So uh, the important thing over here is that what are the drugs available and where do our drugs act? So that will be something that I'm going to discuss in next slide. So you can see from here, uh, number one on the right hand side say fusion inhibitors. So we have first line of drugs available for to treat HIV where we want to stop fusion of this virus to the cell. Right? This is called fusion inhibitors and you can see the idea is to block that. So you can block the entry of viral genome into cytoplasm. The next line of drugs we can have over here is the drugs that will neutralize or block reverse transcriptases. So that's another important drug, line drug that we have, we call NRTIs, which could be uh, based upon the reverse transcriptase or non-reverse transcriptase kind of a drugs which are there to block that step, number two. The third line of drugs that we have is because the other process is that there's an integration of provirus into cell genome, so we can use one line of drugs which are called integrase inhibitors. So these integrase inhibitors are going to act over here and stop that. Okay? And then finally, we will have uh, a drugs we can see protease and maturation inhibitors. So they will stop the final expression of a complete virion where the virus expresses those. So you can see at least four different lines of the drugs based upon pathogenesis of HIV. So they're all available in the market. And I would not go in detail, but that's what something they will teach you in subsequent years. Okay? Now, uh, clinical pictures, if a person has an acute disease, you can see typical flu-like syndromes. If you want to look at the clinical latency period, they monitor CD4 T cells, CD4 always monitor. And then if they have AIDS, we normally found out, find AIDS because if you get opportunistic infections like protozoa, bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And remember, these, uh, these opportunistic infections are coming because you uh, don't have a complete uh, cell-mediated immunity. And many a times we get tumors. So these are the normal tumors. I talked about kyphosis, sarcoma, cervical carcinoma, encephalopathy, and many others. So this is a typical syndrome that you get right from the word go to the end. But if you look at the natural history, they want to monitor CD4 cells. So two things they want to monitor, your virus uh, uh, load and CD4. And you can see these are the events that will happen in a life of a HIV patient over years. So once you have HIV infection, you begin with a thrush, and then you have tuberculosis and pneumocystis. You can see a sequence of events. All of them, what they are doing is they are killing your CD4 T cell. And once you go to that level, that you have zero CD4 T cell, that's many a times death will occur. So it's CD4 T cells in index. If you look at the, the clinical pictures, you can see hairy leukopenia, leukoplakia, oral candidiasis, Kaposi sarcoma is there on the C, and we have pneumocystis pneumonia, and we have cytomegalovirus retinitis, and cryptosporidiosis. So these are some of the clinical pictures that we normally see in these HIV patients. If you want to look at something which is called wasting syndrome before they expire, this is how it looks like. The terminal stages of HIV patient and how much bedridden they become. Now, the important thing for you to know, especially another slide that I want to spend some time on that, you can see that we want to monitor the CD4 T cells. We want to monitor the test that you normally do. For example, we encourage everyone to get a test for HIV. But what do the test? Well, other than the clinical latency, you can see that what they are looking for basically is the uh, most important aspect over here. You can see from primary infection over here, all the way down where the deterioration takes place. And then the clinical latency period, you can see the clinical latency period over here, as the surgeon said, 10 years, it could be 10 or more. So you may see some of the constitutional symptoms, but again, um, you may not show the full-blown uh, disease. Okay? 
a couple of final slides. Uh, this is basically uh, the legend of whatever is there in the first one. And these are the immune responses. So remember I told you the P17, P24. So you can see that uh, your immune system is making antibodies against those, those protein structures. So you have an anti-envelope antibody, which stays for good over here, the brown one. Then you have uh, some other important aspects in terms of CDL responses. But if you want to look at the viral particles in plasma, so viral particles in plasma are maximum within weeks. And then again, they go down, but in terminal stages, they come back. So that's one scenario. If you want to look at the whole infection, like HIV infection, right from the beginning to the, to the end, so if you look at this scheme over here, you have anti-HIV antibodies. This is how your CD4 T cell count look like. You only talk about viremia. And then these are the anti-P24, P24 antibodies that they normally check. They check you for that, and then it will give you an idea as to how the patient is progressing. Next slide, basically, I want you to read it on your own. And for your own information, how HIV is spread, and uh, there are different body fluids that have HIV, especially for sexual transmission and pathway. And then uh, finally, uh, there are some recommendations that are there, especially for people uh, to appreciate the spread and control of these viruses. Okay? Any questions?